Look, I have, you know, mostly enjoyed my time so far with Pokemon Scarlet or Violet. It was the first game in the series to really give a free open world an actual shot. Unlike the stupid, like, open zone kind of structure in Legends Arceus. With that big new change comes big new challenges to overcome. And let's face it, on both a technical and design level, Skull and Violet failed to leap over these hurdles and crash through them with all of the grace of a drunken three-year-old. So today, I'm going to conceptualise how to fix these games up a bit. Not, of course, on a technical level, because I guess that would be just, you know, telling Game Freak to make the games run well, which doesn't really make for any kind of fun conversation. I'm going to be suggesting some changes to the design of the game, focusing mainly on how to make the open world more fun to exist within and explore. So let's begin with exactly that. Exploration. One big selling point about Skull and Viola is that you can go and beat the 18 main objective points in any order that you see fit, which, as a concept, is fantastic. Not many open world games allow the player such a level of freedom. The thing is though, neither do these games. Or at least, they try their hardest to make sure you don't. You see, one of the three main quests in the game is to take down the five Titan Pokemon that are guarding the medicinal Herba Mystica. Each one of these HMs gives your motorcycle monster a new traversal ability. Over time, it will heal up and remember how to sprint, jump higher, glide, swim, and climb in no particular order. This makes getting to any northern parts of the map an absolute pain early in the game, and then some of the main paths are blocked off until you like defeat Team Star at designated bases. While streaming Pokemon Violet, I decided to test out the limits of these systems as best I could, and I was in fact able to reach the highest level gym leader and defeat them before any other gym leader. I did have to beat two of the Titan Pokemon first to gain the Sprint and High Jump abilities, even then I had some difficulties physically getting to the gym. Some of the best open worlds of recent memory are Breath of the Wild and Elden Ring. Both of these games let the player loose after the tutorials and don't really restrict traversal abilities, and that's because it's no fun to explore a world that is constantly fighting back against your exploration. After all, the enemies are there to fight back against the player, the world itself doesn't need to do that. Yes, Breath of the Wild did have a stamina system that kind of made a puzzle out of a lot of the traversal, but in Pokemon, there is nothing like that. You either can or can't climb that cliffside. Or, you know, you can try and turn your motorcycle into a weird backward Skyrim horse and glitch your way up there, but that's not exactly what we call an intended mechanic. So, in a similar way to these other titles, I would suggest that Scarlet and Violet gives you a bit of time to run around in the tutorial on, you know, said motorbike Pokemon, but to then just give yourself the full, like, juiced up bike ready to roll by the time you are unleashed into the wild and sent on your actual quests. Let me just go straight to the first mountain I see, climb right up to the top and just glide off gleefully. The Paldia region actually has a good amount of variety in the terrain, but you spend hours of it just slowly trudging around. Plus, you can't even just make a beeline for all five titans in the first place, because you are more than likely not strong enough to take half of them on until later in the game anyways. Okay, cool, yeah, we've got traversal abilities from the get-go. Or, at least, from the end of the tutorial. Which means there's now no reason to go and fight the titan Pokemon, right? It's like, what reward are we gonna get for beating all of them? Well, how about the cool Titan Pokemon that you fight? Why can't we just take them on our journey? After all, Pokemon is all about catching and training cool monsters, so why not let us have some, like, cool kaiju monsters along the way? The Titans don't necessarily need to be overpowered. They might have, like, the hidden ability unlocked or a cool signature move that's specific to the Titans, but even just having a few massive monsters to throw in battle for the spectacle would be cool. Doesn't need to break the balance of the game necessarily. Maybe this would also be a good excuse to have like each set of the five titans all be version exclusives. We do have Great Tusk or Iron Treads as one exclusive for each game, 
but I would kind of be way more incentivized to trade a Titan with a friend if they had like a massive Jigglypuff to offer me or something. I've already alluded to the other way the game pushes you down certain routes, and that's just that you won't really be ready to tackle the higher level portions of the game without some severe grinding. When I mentioned earlier that I beat the hardest gym first, that not only required me to grind a bunch of chances into candy, but also it just meant that half of my team had to be wild Pokemon that wouldn't listen to me and I just had to hope for the best and use some items. It's not exactly the best system. It really does make zero sense to me that you can fight the gym leaders in any order, but there is also an intended and recommended order. Like, pick a lane, Game Freak. Which one is it? We already kind of had the perfect solution to this problem given to us from the Pokemon Origins anime, and I don't know why Game Freak aren't just stealing that idea. In Pokemon Origins, Brock has already asked Red how many badges he has before the battle, and then he picks out a team of two that is a suitable, sufficient challenge for somebody with zero badges. And how is this not just how it works in Scarlet and Violet? And also, why are we not scaling wild Pokemon's levels to change depending on how many badges you have? That kind of seems basic. With the gyms only being one of the three quest lines, it probably does make a bit less sense to scale them just to the gym badges, because realistically you should have the option to beat all of the gyms immediately, or save them all right until the end and go and do the Titan and Team Star quest first. So maybe a better solution would be to bump up like the, you know, world level every time the player completes maybe like three of the 18 quest points. These are rough numbers of course, but Scaling the levels of Pokemon like this would mean the world slowly levels up with you, regardless of where you are. Admittedly, having the entire game just scale to whatever level you roughly are does actually reduce the difficulty of the game quite significantly. But with the way Scarlet and Violet is designed right now, most players will end up completing the easier parts of the world first, and then moving up to the harder parts of the world later anyway. I think it would be way more interesting to have a world that's scaled roughly to where the player is at the time, but also have, you know, set spawns of higher level Pokemon scattered throughout the region, acting almost like mini-bosses for the adventure. Yeah, you can have a breezy adventure for the most part, but every now and then you'll be jumped by a high-level Tinkerton that is just ready to crush your entire party, and maybe then you'll actually find a use for all those polka dolls you keep randomly picking up. While we are talking about making the games more difficult, why are gym leaders all still monotype focus trainers? These are meant to be tough trainers, tests of might for the party but instead you basically just pick one monster that's super effective against that type and then sweep. I know that Pokemon is a game intended for all ages, and I'm not really asking gym leaders to have, you know, a team of six high-level competitively trained monsters or anything. Just a little bit of type diversity to make better use of the basic game mechanics. And, you know, also if you're gonna let them terrestrialize, like, don't make it so they're forced to do it on the last monster. That was a bit dumb. Not only would this make gyms a little bit tougher, it would also allow for way more fun theming of the teams. No longer would Larry just have to have a team of normal Pokemon. You could give him a food theme team since he battles as a gym leader in a restaurant. Or you could give him like a team of Pokemon that are just done with the world like he is. It would be really fun to see how many team makeups Game Freak could come up with if they weren't forced to have them all of the same typing. It was a fine way to do things, but we've had nine generations of the games doing exactly that. And you know, they've created over a thousand Pokemon at this point. It's finally time that we could, like, genuinely have just a dog walker gym leader with a bunch of good boys and girls. It's clear that many things got left at the wayside when it comes to Scarlet and Violet. More detailed towns and landmarks are certainly a victim of this. Towns and cities are little more than glorified markets in Scarlet and Violet. There are very few NPCs worth even talking to, and the buildings you can enter are basically just shops, and those shops aren't even really shops, they're just menus that pop up. Even the Academy, which is the literal landmark of the entire game, is just a series of small rooms that you teleport between. These kind of things were way more understandable when the games had newly moved out of being top-down, two-dimensional games, but we've nearly had as many 3D generations of Pokemon as we've had 2D ones at this point. I'd love to see a Paldia region that actually feels lived in and built across. 
Some of the town designs are pretty damn cool, but then you just realise that they're all hollow cocoons. They just stop being interesting altogether. And obviously I'm not saying stop at towns and cities alone, I'd just love to come across more buildings and locations throughout the world, you know, ones that actually told a story or had some fun side quests to find. In terms of the open world, the game did do a pretty good job of having a meaningful set of collectibles with the different coloured stakes that are driven into the ground. Plus, the reward being the legendaries that aren't related to the story is also pretty cool. Between them, TMs, the Gimmagool coins, and random items that you can pick up, it would be more than enough provided that that wasn't the only thing available to do in the overworld. The game doesn't need to be crammed with 900 Korok seeds, as funny as that would be, but it could certainly use more interesting NPCs to find out in the wild, and some actual side quests to go and flesh out your journey with. Currently the game essentially boils down to running from one main quest objective to the next, while just kind of keeping an eye out for new monsters to catch. There's definitely a conversation to be had about how co-op could be changed in the game to make it better for this open world as well, but maybe if people are enjoying this video, let me know in the comments and I may make an entire video discussing the problems with just all of the aspects of the multiplayer in this game. The last thing I would want to do to fix these games beside multiplayer is to actually add some end game content that isn't just shiny hunting or raid battles. I think the seven star raids are a pretty cool idea, but again, there are just so many problems with the multiplayer systems in the game that most of them become an exercise in frustration more than anything else. One very annoying part of Pokemon is that the endgame content has lessened over time, but at the same time, the competitive aspects of the game have only become more accessible and talked about with each successive generation. It's so easy to build a team that you want in Scarlet or Violet, between vitamins, hyper training, ability capsules and patches, it's just really simple, and you don't even really need to know how to breed anymore, because you know, even egg moves are super easy to pass on now. So tell me, why is there no Battle Tower, Battle Tree, Battle Maze on Battle Frontier? Pokemon Emerald had a Battle Frontier that, while rather unfair at times, is up there as one of the best and most expansive endgame content in Pokemon games. And that was six generations ago. Throw in some Puffin Makers and a Contest Tent and you'd have yourself an absolute winner. Honestly, in this regard, my expectations are just so low at this point. I'd love to see some more traditional dungeons or the battle subway with all the old gym leaders, but even something just as simple as the battle tree from Sun and Moon would be great. That being said, if it's a choice between nothing or the battle tower from Sword and Shield, uh, I think I'd just say goodbye to that goddamn Gigantamax Charizard and just abandon the whole thing. If you enjoyed this video, maybe give it a cheeky little like, and if you'd like to see some more content like this, you can support my Pokemon rants and more over on our Patreon. Either way, I wish everyone a great day, and thanks for watching. So, a big shout out to our Patreon. <laughs> you still can't say patrons, can you? Shut up. So, a big shout out to our patrons. For oh, well pronounced, Nisha. For supporting the channel, keeping us alive. <laughs> And especially a big shout out to our VIPs. Ah yes, our VIPs. I was down the pub the other day getting a drink with Sir Paradigm, and you'll never guess who I saw. Who? It was a dinner DJ. Oh, I've not seen them for ages. Yeah, How are they was, doing? Well, they're doing fine. I think they were hanging out with Joshua Knapp as well. We were talking about back in the day when Hernan Dio A. Argov used to be uh, Michael Marcus on stage. <laughs> Just reading names now. <laughs> I think they're they're pretty close with Sev. Can you remember Sev? Oh, Sev. Sev was the one who was a superhero called Ryan Ryder. <laughs> Used to ride a motorbike. With, you know, the famous psychic lit litigation hyphen Santa Claus. Ah, yes. They were trying to protect the world from the Red Oak Shield virus, weren't they? I've definitely seen a documentary about them. It's produced by Aram Seb Sabates. Is that the one that was narrated by Jeffrey Odell? It could be. I'm sure Jeffrey's done a lot of work. Like, they've worked for Jub Jub 366. Ah, yes, and they, they, had, they were also advertising that famous uh, brand of coffee, coffee soap. Isn't that the one where it's like edible and also you, you can use it to clean your Tyler Mason's? <laughs> <laughs> I really hope Tyler Mason's watching this like, how dare you use me? How dare you use my name as a place you can clean? <laughs> yes, and it can also, can also wash out your you know abandon. But I'll tell you a good brand of 
cleaning products. It's that company called Thaney Said Alramathy. I think I've seen those. I was around CD Bad's house, hanging out with Eric Toledo and Ryan Lutzel Schwab. And uh, yeah, we managed to get the, uh, we polished that porcelain very good. Ah yes, Ryan, the only redhead in school, yeah. Yeah, no, there was there was Ryan, but there was also Andy Roffel. Ah yeah, Andy, I remember them. Because we always used to say, roll on the floor laughing with Kim Geisha. Geishler, Geishler. Sorry, I'm unseen. Sorry guys. Seen. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> We hope people will enjoy these as much as we are recording them. If we are pronouncing your name wrong, please let us know and we'll try and correct it next time. I know I know how annoying it is to get your name said wrong. Yes, you've lived it and now you can make others live it. I've lived it so many times. <laughs> Thanks to the patrons. Thank you.